リアドバンスのソフトがテレビでも遊べるゲームボーイプレイヤーゲームキューブにセットするだけで新しいゲームのスタイルが始まりますニンテンドーゲームキューブゲームボーイプレイヤー The Game Boy Player was an amazing peripheral for the Nintendo GameCube that allowed you to play any Game Boy, Game Boy Color, or Game Boy Advance game you wanted on your TV. You could even hook your Game Boy Advance up to your GameCube with a special cable and play your game on the big screen with the controls you were used to. It truly was a novel and extremely convenient device that many gamers, myself included, were very grateful Nintendo released. But have you ever stopped and thought about how exactly Nintendo was able to make Game Boy games playable on a GameCube? Up until now, I never really gave it a second thought, but the fact that there's a peripheral that when plugged into the bottom of our console allows us to play any Game Boy game really is amazing. Since it effectively transforms our GameCube into a Game Boy Advance, there surely must be some insanely complicated technology at work here, right? Well, from a theoretical standpoint, it's actually pretty simplistic. But before we can understand why, we have to talk just a little bit about the Game Boy Advance itself. There probably aren't too many people that know this, but the Game Boy Advance actually has two processors. The main processor that's used for running Game Boy Advance games is the ARM7 TDMI 16.78 MHz processor, while the processor used to run Game Boy and Game Boy Color games is the Sharp LR35902 processor that runs at 4.194 or 8.388 MHz depending on the game. These two processors will never run simultaneously. If the game you insert is a Game Boy Advance game, the ARM7 processor will do all the work, and if you insert a Game Boy or Game Boy Color game, the Sharp processor takes over. So essentially when you play an old Game Boy game on a Game Boy Advance, it will turn into a Game Boy at a hardware level without the player even noticing. Nintendo seems to really like this form of backwards compatibility as it's been used on a number of their consoles including the GameCube. As many of you might have already guessed based on that intro, when you attach a Game Boy player to your GameCube, you're essentially plugging a Game Boy Advance into the bottom of your console. If you were to open up the Game Boy player by removing the almost obscene amount of screws that hold the peripheral together, we would see that the board inside the Game Boy Player has the same chip labeled CPU AGB as we can find inside a Game Boy Advance. Now depending on the model of the Game Boy Advance and the model of the Game Boy Player you have, there might be some slight differences in the naming of the chip, but the fact that both contain the same processors should be unchanged. So what does this mean? Well, when you turn your GameCube on with the Game Boy Player boot disk and the disk drive, it tells the console to use the Game Boy Advance chip inside the Game Boy Player to run the game that's in the Game Boy Game Pack slot. So much like how your Game Boy Advance turns into a Game Boy when you play a Game Boy game, your GameCube essentially becomes a big Game Boy Advance when you use the Game Boy Player. But in the case of the Game Boy Player and the GameCube, the processor that has to be used to run a Game Boy game is not found inside the main chip on the GameCube board, so Nintendo had to find some way to access the CPU AGB chip on the Game Boy Player board that wouldn't cause too much lag. This is where the aptly named High Speed Parallel Port comes into play. After all the heavy lifting is done on the ARM7 TDMI or Sharp LR35902, the video and audio data that is to be displayed is sent out to the chip labeled GBS DOL, which bridges the Game Boy Advance CPU and the parallel port. The data is then sent out to the GameCube by way of the parallel port and gets forwarded to your TV from there. That's a pretty long way to go, so Nintendo definitely needed a very fast connection here to make gameplay feel seamless to the player. That's presumably why they went with a parallel port over a much slower serial connection. A serial port, which the GameCube actually has two of, transmits data one bit at a time whereas a parallel port has multiple data lines enabling it to send multiple bits of data at the same time. In the case of the parallel port on the GameCube, it can send 8 bits of data simultaneously at a speed of 80 MHz. Compare this to the 1 bit at 32 MHz that the serial port sees, and it's very clear that the parallel port is many times faster. And that makes gameplay through the Game Boy Player feel almost exactly like you're playing on a real Game Boy Advance. Which I guess you essentially are. Just a bit of a side note here, but while I was doing research for this video, I found out that there's actually a third console that uses the ARM7 processor found originally on the Game Boy Advance. Can you guess what it is? That's right, it's the Nintendo DS. The DS has an ARM9 processor and an ARM7 processor built into the same chip, much like how the original Game Boy Advance has an ARM7 processor and a Sharp processor on its chip. However, in the case of the DS, the ARM7 is used not only for backwards compatibility, but also as a coprocessor for normal DS games. But when you go into Game Boy Advance mode, the ARM9 processor gets essentially deactivated, and the ARM7 processor takes over all processes. Now, since we only have the ARM7 and no Sharp processor, we can't play Game Boy or Game Boy Color games on a DS, but I thought it was kind of interesting how Nintendo kept using this multiple processor approach to backwards compatibility all the way up until the DS. And I just wanted to share that with you in case there was anyone who was curious about how the DS played Game Boy Advance games. As I'm sure many of you are already aware, there are a number of different ways to go about implementing compatibility with games not originally meant to be played on a certain system. You could create an emulator that allows you to run a game on whatever hardware you're dealing with, or you could simply rebuild the game from the ground up to work on your system. But Nintendo decided to actually physically add the processors needed to run their games onto the boards of their consoles, 
or in the case of the Game Boy Player, into their peripherals. It's really not that elegant of a solution because essentially what you're doing is just cramming a Game Boy into whatever console you want to play Game Boy games on, but since the games are running on the originally intended processors, they work really well. And in the case of the Game Boy Player, a peripheral was going to be needed anyway to accept Game Boy cartridges, so I guess Nintendo figured they may as well just put a Game Boy inside of it to save on time and money and achieve the same or possibly an even better result. In my opinion, the GameCube looks almost incomplete without a Game Boy Player attached to the bottom of it, and since it's such an important part of the system to me, I wanted to make an effort to look into just how this square block of plastic actually works. When I first started my research, I definitely wasn't expecting to find out that it's just a Game Boy Advance that hooks into the bottom of your GameCube, but nevertheless, I'm happy I got to find out the secrets of this rarely talked about piece of gaming history. And hopefully I was able to shed a bit of light onto the inner workings of the Game Boy Player for you guys as well. If you enjoyed the video, consider giving it a like, it's always greatly appreciated and helps me out a ton. And if you want to see more videos like this in the future, consider subscribing as well. As always, thanks so much for watching everybody, and I'll see you in the next one. Back out.